Everybody here, <laughs> almost everybody here. Almost everybody here, but they can, can people, keep. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, almost everybody here, but they can join while we are still okay. in our conference. So that's what I was. I, ask. I will start by saying, Sandy, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. We've we've had with Sandy a very nice friendship for many years. We took many exams together. We have judged together many times. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks well, for accepting. Thank you for having me. It is a pleasure to be here, and I'm so grateful to be part of this wonderful um, medium. Okay, so hold on a second. I'm going to silence everybody. If you have to, if you want to ask a question, you can send me a chat, or you can um, uh, request to the chat that you want to talk, and then I will open the microphone for you. Okay. Uh, so now so that we have a better connection, only Sandy and myself will have the microphone. So Sandy, let's start. So what are your ideas to improve scores? Hold on, hold on, because Sandy. There, now, how's that? Now you're on. You can ah, start again. Okay, super. Um, I had a lot of ideas about improving um, your score in a test, and I just narrowed it down to 25. <laughs> so hopefully we could get to all of them. Um, and I wanted to say as well, so a lot of these will be obvious to many of you, and then some of them won't. So. I'm hoping that there are little tips here um, to help everybody um, get a better score on their test. So shall and we start? Yes, let me ask you the first question. Are you going to focus on the FEI levels only or would that include training, first, second, third level? Ah, that's an excellent question. I made sure to address all of the levels, um, especially training through fourth level, because um, we judge a lot of those levels and um, I think it's important. So, and a lot of these points will apply to all the levels. Okay, great, so let's great. start. Okay, um, the first part of this applies to things you can do before the show and the second part um, applies to things that actually happen in your test. So let's start by, let's start with number one. Um, and that is make your basic work at home as correct as possible. I know that sounds pretty obvious, but realize that the tests that you write at a show are a reflection of the work that you do at home. And it shows if your daily training is good. So what we're looking for at all levels, from training level all the way up to Grand Prix, is that the test looks easy, that you're comfortable, you and your horse being comfortable in that test, um, and that the horse is fluid and free from resistance, that your horse is becoming more and more symmetrical as he goes up the levels, meaning he bends equally both directions, um, and you know, it, it basically says that if your basics are good, your, your score can still be good, even if you have minor mistakes. So I'm advising to adhere to the training schedule or training scale as much as possible. Um, and at all levels, we're looking for throughness, which in German is Durchlässigkeit, permeability, um, energy flowing unrestricted from back to front, and that the back is lifted and swinging and that the horse has a supple contact, basically a harmonious picture. Um, and basically, if it isn't feeling too good at home, um, it probably won't look too good at the show. So if things are still a bit rough, you may need a little more time to practice um, before you go to the show. So enough Sandy. on that. Yes. Sandy. Let me ask you a question. Sometimes yes. when I do clinics and I'm talking with, with some of the riders, I, yes. I stressed a lot the position of the 
writer. Yes. And sometimes I get the answer like, oh no, I, I can write here like this, but then I'll go to the show and then I will have a nice posture or my mm -hmm. hands will be better or my legs will be better, whatever. What would you say to these people? Ah, <laughs> I get that a lot as well. And it's funny that you bring that up because guess what number two is on my list? Work on your position. So what I tell those people is that you must work on your position at home uh, because otherwise you won't be an effective rider. You need to be an effective rider, which will lead to better scores. And I'm a huge fan of lunge lessons, of riding without stirrups, and teaching people that a good seat is an effective seat and leads to correct aids. And that you can't just miraculously have a good position when you get to the show when it's not good at home. Um, and, and going on with that, um, I think if the position isn't good and the rider's bouncing on the horse's back, you know, the horse learns to push his back away and then the horse doesn't develop the correct muscling either. So, um, and I've gotten that in clinics too. I can relate to that. So, um, yeah, position is really, really, really important. And that's why it's, it's number two on my list. Okay, so, great. So let's go to number two. Okay, so that was number two. Work on your position to be more effective um, number three, read the purpose at the top of the USEF tests um, so that you can pick a test which is suitable for you and your horse. Um, so important. The requirements increase with each level. And even though it's a great goal to move up a level each year, it's possible that you and your horse need another season at the same level to become really proficient. So I advise getting a, a good unbiased opinion, not your mother's, of which level you are really ready for, you and your horse. And Sesa, I'm sure you can agree with this. I would rather see a really good training level test then a second level test where the horse is unsteady in the contact, isn't really showing an uphill tendency, um, or I'd rather see a really nice, well-ridden pre-St. George rather than an I-2 or a Grand Prix where the horse and rider can't fulfill most of the requirements of the level. Um, I, I, so I, again, yeah. I fully agree with you, but then I have a question. Sometimes when you say this, when you're talking, with students or with people that you have judged, mm -hmm. then they say, oh, but I've been doing second level for four years. So I, <laughs> the horse must go on to third or fourth level. And right. let's say they don't have flying changes. Right. They jump to the other level. So what, what's your advice for, for this? Yeah, that, that's a tricky one. And it, it depends a little bit on the, the level of the horse and the where the rider is in his or her training. Um, sometimes I say, you know, maybe your trainer could put in a few rides on the horse a per week so that the horse advances a little bit as well. And then the rider can learn from the horse and try to move up that way. Um, you know, that that's that's usually helpful. What what do you what do you how do you handle that when that happens? Well, I, I usually say that it's not really you, the one that pick up the level. Mm -hmm. It's the horse, the ones that will tell you what level you're on. So as you were saying before, if in your training, the whole horse is uncomfortable with the level and mm -hmm. things are not working, let's say you cannot have flying changes or you know, you don't have the ability to bend and collect. Well, you, you cannot show third level or fourth level. You have to go down a little bit and wait because it's the horse, the one that tells you. Right. So I, yeah. I totally agree with you. Thank you. But that, that is a, that is a, a tricky, a tricky situation for sure. Yeah. 
So, okay. So I, I have a question now. Yeah. A friend of mine is asking, Fabrizia is asking if you're gonna talk about junior level. Um, what specifically about junior level? Well, that's more or less third level. So I think you'll have some advice for third level tests. Yes, I okay. think so. Good, go ahead. Yep. Okay, so number four, focus on both basics and criteria. And what that means is, um, as judges, we look for both. And basics really means the training scale. Um, and by now, I'm sure you're all familiar with the training scale, so I don't really need to go over it, but I will if you want me to. Um, but, you know, basics really means, you know, does the horse really have a clear rhythm? Does he show relaxation and suppleness? Um, a steady and elastic con contact? Um, and then on to impulsion, straightness, and collection. So those are the basics. Criteria means the requirements of each movement. For example, the angle in a shoulder in, the number of flying changes, etc. cetera. Um, bottom line is you need to have both to get a good score on each movement. And an example is you could get the same score for both of these scenarios. Let's say you have the ideal angle and bend in a shoulder in, but it's lacking in impulsion or has an unsteady contact. So it has good criteria, but it's lacking in basics. Or you have your horse has an elastic swinging trot with nice balance, but your shoulder in doesn't have enough angle or it's overbent in the neck. So it's showing good basics, but not fulfilling the criteria. So those two scenar scenarios could get the same exact score. Um, so for a high score, you need to satisfy both basics and criteria. Number five, try to school at home one level above what you are showing. And- I love that one. Yeah, thank you. I, I get a lot of argument with this. I totally <laughs> Some, agree. That's great. <laughs> sometimes with my own students, um, it does take away some stress because you know you can easily perform the test since you know that you can do a higher level at home. So this will make the test that you've chosen a lot easier um, and it can lead to higher scores because you'll be more comfortable with the test. Um, if you have some problems with some movements at home, it'll probably be worse at the show. So um, I think that's really important to make sure that you, you can school a higher level at home than you're showing. Um, also, just because you might have an FEI schoolmaster, if you are only experienced up to, let's say, first level or so, it might be a better idea to move up the levels gradually so that you get comfortable with the increased demand for collection and the more difficult exercises. Um, and it'll be nicer for the horse too. Because so many times, and Cesar, I, I'm sure that you have seen this too, riders will ha you know, buy a nice pre-St. George schoolmaster and then they're trying to show a high level and it's just not looking too good. Um, and it's, it's maybe better to take it a little bit slowly and, you know, just because the horse is that level doesn't mean the rider is. So anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think, I think that is so important because what we really want to see, the judges want to see that the test is performed with ease. Yes. That it looks natural for both horse and rider. So yes. when you are training at home at a higher level, as you just said, then it looks easier for the horse and for the rider, then that's yes. when the high marks come. Exactly. Easy, soft, relaxed, fluent. Yes. And it, for that, you need to really master everything that you have to do. So I totally agree. I think that's I phenomenal Super. advice, which Super. I always do. I always say the same thing, and I understand that people, not, not everybody agrees with us. Yeah, they don't always want to hear it. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, bottom line, it, it has to look easy. It has to look easy. All right, number six, know your test 
really well. Even if you have a reader, even if it's training level, first level, because sometimes the reader makes a mistake. And if the reader reads the wrong thing and you go the wrong way, you get the error and your score goes down. So um, an example, I wrote a test years ago and my reader was writing the wrong, reading the wrong test. Um, luckily I knew the test, I knew where to go and uh, I didn't get an error, but it easily could have deteriorated into that. So, um, and then I wanted to add to, you know, when you're writing these tests, you want to you want to visualize your test. You want to picture yourself riding through the whole test where your half halts are going to be. You want to know it so well that you don't have to concentrate only on where you're going. When you ride a test, you want to alternate your focus between where you're going and then the quality and the execution. Um, everybody has a different way of doing this, but it's, to me, it's the easiest to go back and forth between the two because if you only steer from movement to movement, the ride will lack quality. Um, and conversely, if you only focus on the quality, you might forget where you're going. So you kind of have to, to go back and forth a little bit. So anyway, um, that's important because you don't want an unnecessary error for, uh, for going the wrong way. May I add something to that? While you're learning the test, it's not only the test itself, but reminding every time, how are you going to prepare each exactly. move? So it's not only that, you know, C, turn right, M, X, K, medium trot. It's also knowing how am I going to prepare my turn to the right? Mm -hmm. How I'm going to set up my horse for the medium trot? how I'm going to wait until he's straight, how I'm going to generate the power, you know, all those little things. Yes. If you practice and you know your test together with how you should prepare each movement, like how to get into the corner to do a good shoulder in. It's not only, okay, there, shoulder in. I have to prepare to get there. So exactly. if you don't mind learning your test, but really getting here in your head, in your soul almost. Like, you know exactly how you're going to prepare each movement. It's so much, it gets so much better when you are there because you already know not only where, how to turn right or left, but how to prepare your turn. Yes, yes, I agree. Prepare, prepare, prepare and know where your half halts are going to be and ride half halts very important yep absolutely otherwise you're just steering through the test and then the horse loses quality yep i have, I have a question sandy yes from uh, guatemala okay. so he says one of the problems with practicing the test is the horse anticipating the movement <laughs> what would you recommend to prepare the test while avoiding this Yes, that's very interesting. That's actually uh, down farther on my list. <laughs> and it is, um, I'll actually go to that. That's down on uh, later on, but it's uh, don't over prepare your test by writing it over and over, especially if you have a really smart horse, because some horses will start anticipating the next movement. Um, other horses will just get bored by riding the same thing over and over and they'll get lazy and behind your leg. So I always advise students to rarely ride through the entire test, but ride bits and pieces of the test. Um, and then sometimes uh, put things where they're, where they're not exactly in the test. Like when you come down the center line and you want to practice your halt, I have my students sometimes go past X and do the halt down at G or at I. Um, just so that the horse doesn't automatically stop there. Um, and again, bits and pieces, you know, and, and maybe ride through the whole thing from beginning to end, maybe once a week or something, but not more than that. That's what I would suggest for that, especially if you have a smart horse who, who thinks he knows better than you. <laughs> That's very interesting. We had one of our previous guests, Tina Irving. Mm -hmm. I remember her saying that at home, 
she usually canters down the center line, never a lot of cantering down the center line without yeah. stopping at X without or stopping. Down doing the periods and then go and prepare or try the halt in a quarter line or out yeah. in the field or, you know, different things so that they don't get bored and they don't start anticipating. Yep, I agree. Well, today, one of my students was practicing for the pre-St. George and I had her practice her half canter pirouettes at the end of the diagonal. That's, that happens. And the horse was a little bit like, whoa, we don't do this. <laughs> so it was great because she had to really, you know, get him on the aids and, uh, you know, and pass through X and then collect him and then do the half pirouette. And then she did a flying change at X. And, you know, we, we mix things up a lot because the horses are just so smart. So excellent question. So, okay, okay so keep going. Okay, um, on the same note, um, try to practice your test away from home a time or two before the show, especially if you have a new horse, just so you can simulate riding it in front of a judge and that you can see how your horse behaves away from home. Um, a lot of horses are not the same away from home as, as they are when you're schooling at home. Um, also, schooling shows are good, ride a test clinics are good, good ways to practice. Um, and you know, it's just a good way to, when you get to the real show, you'll be prepared and you won't lose points because your horse is really tense or you don't know what to expect. So anything you want to add to that? No, I totally agree. Especially okay. with young horses. Yes. It's always good to go to the show atmosphere because yes. everything changes. So if you already know how they're going to react, you you can prepare better, like yeah. especially the warm up time. Yes. Because that's one thing that you can lose or you can win a test if you know exactly what your warm up time in horse, situa in horse show situation is. Because one thing is their behavior at home, and it can be different, very different in a show atmosphere. So I totally yeah. agree with you. Yep. Yeah. And, and it, that's interesting because I was going to talk about that next, the warm-up strategy to, to try to I figure out. To God, we, never, we never talk about this before. I know. It's true. Um, but it's so important to figure out the best warm-up strategy for your horse because, you know, some horses need a longer warm-up at a show and some horses need a shorter one depending on the day. You know, some horses are hotter on the first day and then they get tired on the second day. Um, so you need to learn to adjust the warm up according to that so that the horse isn't too tired for the test or, you know, or that he's still a little too excited. Um, and that just comes with experience and getting to know that particular horse. And, you know, bottom line, you want to present your horse at his best to get a good score, um, where you're showing good energy, but that he's still supple and, and not too tense and, uh, and staying in control <laughs> is always good. Um, so another point that I wanted to make that goes together with that is don't try to win the warm up. And what I mean by that is when you get to the show, there's a lot of pressure sometimes, especially at some of the bigger shows, a lot of stress, um, people are watching, they're hanging over the rail, your friends are watching. Do your normal routine and stay true to your horse. Um, try not to overwork your horse or try to make him look super impressive in the warm up to the point where you don't have much horse left for your actual test. And I've seen this a lot, especially at the bigger shows. Um, I remember one year watching the warm up at my first Devon where I was competing and I was totally intimidated by the fancy things I saw in the warm up, And I thought for sure those horses would get huge scores and would be winning the class and everything. But as it turned out, most of them didn't place in the top half of the class because they were trying to win the warm up, you know, kind of showing off for people watching and stuff. Um, I guess the moral of the story is stick with the warm up plan that works for you and for your horse so that you have the best experience in the show ring. 
Um, and I'll add something else to that. I'll never forget this. I was in Germany and I was watching Hubertus Schmidt warm up for a test. And this is a, quite a few years ago, but he was just trotting around and around in this kind of normal, kind of boring trot. He was suppling and stretching and bending his horse. And it really was unremarkable. Um, but then he started shortening the reins and he started collecting the horse and he wrote a few movements and then he let him stretch again. And it was really, really kind of a, a normal looking, not impressive warm up. But then by the end, the horse looked amazing and he went into the show ring and rode one of the most beautiful, fluid, energetic, expressive tests that I've seen in a long time so he obviously knew his horse and had confidence in his system and he was not trying to win the warm-up he didn't care what it looked like so anyway that's 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 really important yeah so. you probably were with me once <laughs> in uh, in olympia in london oh yeah when uh, Charlotte was riding the mare that she's competing now, but at that time, this was like three or four years ago. Mm -hmm. She was much younger. And Carl, they did a master class in Olympia in front of, you know, big stadium, big audience. And at the beginning, I started looking at this mare, and all the warm up was exactly what you just described mm -hmm. just stretching, bending, supple. And I, I look at the mirror and it's like, yeah, it's kind of nice, but... Kind of nice, but yeah. To yeah. go home about, you know? Mm -hmm. But then at the end, they started collecting and the expression and the suppleness and everything was amazing. So I think mm -hmm. that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That, that, was a, that was fun to watch. I agree. Yeah. So, okay, so now I'd like to go on to more about the actual test, test writing. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm going to start it with the first impression, your entry, your halt, your move off. This is the first impression the judge has of you and your horse. So try to make it good. Try to get a straight center line and halt. The horse stays on the bit during the salute because if he doesn't, the side judge will see that, um, you know, and, and try to get a straight and prompt move off. And th this is all stuff that you can practice at home, but it really makes a good impression when you just nail that center line. Um, and if the halt isn't completely straight, you know, it, we're, you know, especially like at training level and first level, that happens a lot. You need to decide if you can quickly fix it and get that, that halt straight or if you try to fix it, it might cause the horse to move around and wiggle around even more and it might get worse and that might affect the move off as well. So you have to make the decision <laughs> how much you wanna influence there. And, and you know, the more showing you do, the, you know, the really clever riders, sometimes if it's not perfectly straight, they'll just kind of move off anyway because they don't wanna make it worse. So, uh, Anyway, um, this is a, a little side thing. This, is not, this does not affect your score, but just a reminder that at the salute, um, you need to take the reins in one hand and let one arm hang loosely at your side during the salute, not sticking the arm straight out to the side, which is what I've been seeing a lot of lately. <laughs> so I don't know where that, that salute came from, but anyway. Now, my next point is accuracy. Um, very important. Be Sandy, as accurate. Oh, I'm sorry. Sandy, excuse me. Yes. I know we judges, we're not supposed to watch anything but right after the horse enters at eight, right? Right. But we're humans. So what would your recommendation be for the time the rider is going around the arena? In terms before of the test? Right. yes, the, the the minute before you know he goes in front of the judge at C, goes one time around, mm -hmm. and 
you know, waiting for the signal to enter. What, what would you recommend during that minute? If I would we're say- We're not supposed to see that. Yeah, I, I would say use your 45 seconds wisely. You are not being judged as you go around the outside of the arena and the judge is usually writing his or her comments. So use that time to make any last minute adjustments to your horse's balance. Um, if your horse is a little behind the leg, you might want to ride some medium or extended canter to get them going. Um, or if you need to improve the balance and the collection, ride some extra transitions or half halts. That's, that's your time. So use it wisely. In fact, that's, that's one of my points, you know, because you're not being judged. And if, if you need to, to, you know, do an extended canter and really get the horse in front of your leg, do it. Um, and then, then you're going to have a good experience. That's my, my advice on that. Thank you. I, I totally agree. I have, I have a request from one of yes. the participants. Can you do a demo of the salute, please? <laughs> of, the, of, of the right salute or the, or yes. the salute? Yes, and I think great. that's very important. <laughs> Of the, of the right one or the one that makes me crazy? Both. I think both would make it fun. Okay. I don't know if you can see, though. You have to move back a little bit. I have to move back. Okay. How's that? Perfect. Okay, perfect. Okay. Okay, so you come in. You halt. Take the reins in one hand. Drop one the arm here and nod. And pick up again and go. The one I don't like is come in and haul, take the reins, and they stick the arm out like this, and then continue. <laughs> Good. That was a very but, clear I mean, demonstration. I, there's, there's no point deduction. That's just a pet peeve of mine. Because yeah, it, does, it, does, it does say in the rules the arm should hang loosely at the side. <laughs> Oh, we could go over pet peeves over and over if we want to. Um, okay, so on to, yeah, I wanted to talk a little bit about accuracy yes. in your test. You know, you want to be as accurate as possible because it shows that your horse is really on your aids. However, don't sacrifice quality in order to be accurate. And what I mean by that, a good example is, let's say you need to do a flying change and the horse isn't quite balanced. You need to do a little extra half halt to get him ready. And the change ends up being slightly earlier or slightly later. It's better to do that than to force the horse to do the change at the letter and then he loses his balance and it's late behind, et cetera. Um, so you'll get a small deduction for the lack of accuracy, but it's better than getting an insufficient mark for a late behind change. Um, and of course, if you have both, if you have accuracy and quality, you'll get a much higher score. Uh, did you, did you want to add anything to that, Cesar, or give another example? Uh, no, no, I think the example you made is perfect. Okay. Uh, but sometimes what you see is that there is quality, but they're losing points because yes. of the lack of precision. Okay. For instance, a beautiful trot, nice frame, 20 meter circle in, uh, between B and E on a training level test, mm -hmm. but it just does, doesn't look like a circle, but like an egg. Mm -hmm. And you go like, oh my God, this could have been the eight or the nine. Mm -hmm. and the rider is missing it just because the shape of the circle is terrible. Agreed. Especially from the side judge. Yes. Because the side judge can really see that. And, and it's rare to see a circle at B and E that's actually 20 meters. And the riders need to understand that where the circle touches the center line, it's two meters to the inside of, of I and L, not to the outside. Um, and if you draw it, you'll, it'll make sense. Um, but I completely agree with you. And that's something we see a lot. A lot. A lot. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I have another. No, you're not. Before we move on. 
Fra Fabricia is asking, should we relax the horse outside the arena? You mean before the bell is rung, while it's your turn to go around the outside? Yes. Yes. Th again, that's your time and to do whatever you need to do to get your horse to feel the way you want him to in your test. So if he's tense and you want to do, I, I saw Isabel Vant before a Grand Prix test do rising trot long and low around the outside of the arena. And then the bell rang and she sat the trot, picked up the reins and went in and did, did her test. So yeah, we've, we've also seen Stefan Peters doing that in Wellington this season. I've seen him doing that at World Cups in Vegas, mm -hmm. you know? There you go. Rising trot, stretching around mm -hmm. the arena before the Grand Prix. Mm -hmm. Yep. It worked. Yep. It worked for, and if that's, you know, if that's what the horse needs, you know, and conversely, if your horse is asleep, you might need to get him going around the yeah. outside. So yeah, that's your time to do what you need to do before that bell rings. Whatever is necessary to get it yep. the frame you want. Yep, absolutely. All right, so moving on, um, I, I wanted to talk about knowing where you can take risks to get more points um, and when it's safer to just get it done. And what I mean by that is let's say your horse, let's say his collected walk rhythm can get a little bit unclear if you ask for more activity you might need to just keep the horse a little bit more subdued in his tempo to, to keep the rhythm okay. Um, and the judge might say something like, needs more activity and give him a six or something, rather than irregular rhythm and an insufficient mark. Um, so be clever about you know the things that you want to highlight on your horse and the things that you just want to kind of get by and be happy with um you know with with a mark above above insufficient you know and on, on the other side of that if you know that you have a horse who has a really good extended trot or extended canter or whatever um go for it go for that high mark on those things you know go for a 10 if your horse has a really nice extended walk you know show it off um, so that again comes with experience with riding a lot of tests with knowing your horse, you know, know where you can pick up more points and really highlight what your horse does well. Um, and that brings me on to transitions. That's another great place to pick up points um, by riding good, clear transitions, because these transitions count as much as the extension that you just rode. Um, especially in second level. Second level has a lot of transitions. So try to make them clear and prompt without resistance. Let the judge see a transition both into and out of your lengthening medium or extension um, because a lot of riders throw away points there by just sort of blending into the corner after a, a lengthening or a medium instead of showing a crisp transition. Um, the other point I wanted to make um, <laughs> is basically if you get over it. If, if, if a movement didn't go too well and there, or there's a little mistake or a little bobble, just you know forget about it and move on to the next movement because you have a chance to score a 10 in each of those boxes. So try not to dwell on the mistake, stay confident, and try to do better on the, on the next movement. And that's the nice thing about riding a dressage test. You get an opportunity to get a high score in every single one of those little boxes. Um, so, yeah. Um, anything you would want to add to that? Well, no, I would, I would like to just to say that all all of these comments that you've made are good for the junior level test. For, the, for my friend that was asking about junior level, there you go, yes. you have you know, the entrance, the transitions, the geometry, all of mm -hmm. that. The accuracy. The accuracy, everything. The quality, yeah. And balancing basics with criteria. Yes. You know, show like in your half pass in third level, not just the correct angle and bend, but also the quality of the trot, the elasticity, the engagement, 
um, things like that. Very important there. So, I, I would say that in the junior level test, we see quite often that the half passes from B or E to G usually don't go to G. They go like eight meters before yes. or four meters after. That's very important. You can, you can yes. get a lot of points there. If yep. you're accurate on the letter where you start and the letter where you finished. Yes, exactly. And, and also in the leg yields in first level, you know, to make sure that they start and end where they're supposed to. Um, very important. Yep, yeah, I agree. The half passes in the St. George, the same. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, you know, and that brings me to another thing, which is know where each movement starts and ends. And if there is a mistake, try to fix it as soon as possible so it doesn't affect the next movement. Um, I'm thinking about in the pre-St. George, what happens sometimes is in the half pirouette in the canter, the horse will change leads. If that happens, immediately, as quickly as you can, get yourself back on the correct lead so that you can get a score for the counter canter and the change. Otherwise, you'll get two low marks instead of one. Um, also, more accuracy stuff, if you're doing shoulder in from the corner to the E and then an eight meter circle at E, um, don't straighten first before the circle. Ride the shoulder end directly into the eight meter circle and then half halt and then directly into the half pass. Um, also, as far as accuracy with transitions, make sure you make those transitions when your body is at the letter, the rider's body at the letter, especially for halts at C across the short side. Um, they're oftentimes too early or too late. Um, also, it's important to know that corner letters, the transitions that happen in the corner letters are when the horse's nose approaches the letter. Um, and if you have a flying change at the end of a diagonal, you need to do the change as the horse's nose approaches the letter while his body is still straight on the diagonal, not when the horse bends around the corner, which we see a lot. Um, That's and then I have a, right? Very you, important. Yes. Um, also, you know, things like in training level, in training level test three, if you're doing your canter circle at B and the horse breaks into trot, try to pick up that canter again so that you can get the score for the transition to the trot at A. Um, otherwise, you'll get two low marks instead of one. Um, things like in first level, the shallow canter loop where you go from the corner to X back to the corner, um, the horse needs to stay in the same bend. You do not change the bend over X. For instance, if he's on the right lead, he needs to be bent to the right, even when you're doing that little counter counter part over X. Um, and I bring that up because a lot of people don't know that and they think, that they should be bending them to the left, even though they're on the right lead. So, um, and I also wanted to say something quickly about staying on course whenever possible. If you, if you make a mistake or there's a disturbance of some kind, try to stay on course. Don't make a circle and then try your movement again, because if you do that, you'll get an error and a low mark because we're only supposed to judge the first attempt. So I, I think that's pretty clear, but I just wanted to make a reminder because it's so tempting. Like, oh no, I messed that up. I'm going to circle and do it again. Try not to do that because you'll lose points, lots of points. <coughs> so, um, and my next point, um, say you saw you already touched on this a little bit when we were talking about preparation um and i just wanted to add you know that you should use the short side whenever possible um as judges we notice the short side and what happens on the short side but there usually aren't any major movements happening there so make use of the short side to prepare for what's coming up you know if you know you have a shoulder end coming up and you need to get the horse a little more collected um, or you need to rebalance the horse, you know, use those short sides because it'll help you prepare 
for what's coming up. Um, next point, work on the walk. Lots of points are thrown away on the walk. Sometimes the riders just kind of take a rest during the walk and the horse is sort of losing energy. And um, this is really important, especially because like the extended walk and the free walk, they have a coefficient of two. You know, they, they have as much weight as a canter pirouette. So also know the requirements of the different walks. Like a lot of people ride medium walk, like collected walk. They don't know that the medium walk has to cover ground. It has to be active um, in the tempo. You know, oftentimes riders slow it down or they try to do collected walk instead of medium walk. Um, also with uh, the approach to working pirouette or, or yeah, work, or turns on the half turns on the haunches and pirouettes, half pirouettes in the walk. The tempo should stay active before, during, and after the half turn. Um, a lot of people slow down and the horse loses the energy and then he gets stuck behind. Um, so those things are, it's important to practice those at home I, I think i have i have a question from one of our guests yes what would be your expectations for an extended walk for an extended walk i'd like to see the horse cover as much ground as possible in a clear rhythm i make sure to look that the back is active and swinging and that the horse's top line is relaxed and that he's clearly stretching into the contact um, and I'm looking for all of those things and that the walk um, also has energy. And that, that's a lot of things to look for. But, you know, you can practice that. Um, and I'll add something to that, too. A, a lot of riders have trouble going from the extended walk or the free walk back onto the bit. Um, the horse is either slow down or brace or there's a, a rhythm problem. And that's something I recommend you do a lot at home, letting the reins out, taking the reins up again, over and over, so that you can do it without the horse losing energy and throughness and, uh, and swing over the back. I have another question mm -hmm. uh, from one of the participants. How are the reins supposed to be in the extended walk? That's a really good question. Um, there should be a light contact in the extended walk. The rider should not drop the reins and have them looping like, it, like is allowed in the free walk. There should be a little bit of contact and the neck should be a little, for me, the neck should still be a little bit rounded, but the top line stretching out as much as possible without losing contact with the bit. And that's an excellent question. Because oftentimes we see an extended walk, the rider will just throw the reins at the horse. Um, and that's not extended, that's a free walk. Yeah, yeah good that's question. Very, very clear, thank you. Super, you're quite welcome. Um, I wanted to add too that um, it's important to keep practicing these walk half pirouettes. Um, half turns on the haunches and then later the half pirouettes because that's an exercise that's with us for a long time. It's with us from second level all the way to pre-St. George. So we might as well <laughs> learn to do it early, you know, because we rarely see, I don't know about you, Cesar, but I rarely see really nice uh, walk half pirouettes and turns on the haunches. You know, and if I see a good one, I get really happy and give it a high mark because I'm so yeah. excited that, you know, it has the, the correct rhythm and activity and balance and the bend and the size and the energy and the horse stays on the bit and he doesn't go behind the vertical. I mean, all the things that can happen in that fairly quick exercise. So that's, that's a place to have a good ground person who can help you with that because that exercise is around with us for a long time in these yeah, tests. I, I totally agree. And I have two more other, two other questions about the extended walk. How's yes. the neck and the head position 
how they should be in the extended walk? You know, for me, as they shouldn't be, they should not be behind the vertical. Um, I like if there's an if the if the there's truly energy from behind and the horse is really over his back, he'll have a softly arched neck while he's stretching forward into the contact. Um, and it and it varies a little bit according to the horse as well because different horses have different shaped necks. Um, but I still want to see that there is a connection from the hind leg coming over the swinging back, over the relaxed neck to the, to the accepting mouth of the horse. Good, that's very important. Yes, Thanks. absolutely. Um, another point I wanted to make is the importance of getting a good halt and rein back. Um, a lot of these tests have halt, rein back, and this is a great place to get a good score. Um, it's something to practice at home to get a good quality trot or canter before the halt and show a balanced transition to the halt and a balanced halt where the horse clearly takes weight behind without his nose being pulled behind the vertical. Um, and in the rein back to keep the same balance as in the halt and that the horse comes back in diagonal steps. And, and, and it's lovely to see a really nice halt and rein back where the rider isn't pulling back. The horse is still thinking forward, even though rain, it's rein back, but the horse should still be thinking uh, back to front, connecting from back to front. Um, and it's so important because oftentimes we see the rider pulling back and the pole will go down which will cause the croup oftentimes to come up, which is the opposite of what we want to see. Um, so we'd like to see the rider keep the hand soft so the jaw doesn't get tense, the mouth stays nice, um, and, and the halt rein back, it really shows if, if the rider has the horse through. And uh, Cesar, I'm sure you remember this, in the, in the old days, I think it was in the I, I1 probably, where we had to do the schaukel, we yep. have to go to the halt and then rein back four, go forward four steps, and then back six steps, and then move on into, I don't know, what was it, trot or canter? I don't even remember. Um, <laughs> was it trot? Yeah. But that was really hard. And it, it really showed, you know, is your horse balanced and through? Um, so... I love that exercise. <laughs> it showed how, whether the training was good or not. Okay, uh, next. Let, excuse me. I have, I have a, 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 a small story. Okay. We were judging in like Wellington, and I was beginning. And here comes Laura Graves. And she had to do the halt at sea with the rain back and the proceed. And I thought that was the best I had seen in my life. So I gave a 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, our research judge general was there. Mm -hmm. And I said, how, after the class had finished, I said, how much did you give to the rain bag? He said, honestly, I don't remember. And then probably an eight. And then I said, oh, I think I screwed up because I gave Oh, it. no. <laughs> then we went out for dinner. And in the middle of the dinner, he asked the rest of the judges, how much did you give for the rain back? Mm -hmm. And nobody really remember. And people said like, you know, seven and a half or eight or something. And then I thought to myself, now I'm going to be hardly criticized for my <laughs> And then Stephen Clark says, well, I think the only one that didn't screw up, and I was only a three star. Well, Cesar, because I kept thinking after he asked me after the test, what could be better on that what whole could be better? Back? What else yep. could we expect for a halt and rain back and the departure and everything was really great. So I think yep. that is a movement for a 10. So it's easy to yep. get. It is. Do it well. That's one of the movements where you can get high scores because not often we see good halts and rain backs. Agreed. It's especially if the quality of the gate before and after is really good. 
Yep. You know, we've seen Totilas get tens on that. Um, I gave a 10 on that in a third level test in California a couple years ago. Same, same as you. It, I could not have imagined it any better. It was clearly a 10. And it, it was just so exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yes, when yeah. we see so, Yeah. So, okay, so um, we're getting actually near the end. I only have a couple more of things. And um, my next point is, is try not to ask for more power than you can balance and control. Um, I've noticed there's this trend of kind of running the horses off their feet lately thinking that it's forward um even at the fei levels and especially in the half passes um it isn't good if the horse is running around leaning on the reins and not showing any elasticity or suspension um i'm sure you all are familiar with this uh, expression speed is the enemy of impulsion that has been around for a long time for a good reason and it means forward does, doesn't mean hurried and you won't get a better score. Um, you'll probably get a lower score. So don't ride your tests like you're riding in an auction. <laughs> Forward does not mean I'm fast. I'm so happy you mentioned this because that's always one of my points. People start screaming like forward, 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 forward thinking that forward is hurried. And that's right. not what we want to see. Mm -hmm. Great. Yep. Absolutely, and and we see it a lot. So, okay, all levels. Yeah, exactly, exactly, absolutely. So I think that's very okay. important. Okay, uh, next point: learn to ride a really good shoulder in. Um, nothing says more about a rider's level of education to me than how she rides the shoulder in. We find shoulder in from second level all the way up to the FEI levels, kind of like our walk half pirouette. Um, it's the cornerstone of dressage. It's been around for hundreds of years. There's a reason for that. And I know uh, Bill and Bill had a whole segment on it. Um, it's important. And also this ties in with our first question about the rider position. Um, it's really important that the rider has the right position and shoulder in because it relates to almost all of the other movements. Um, to do a good shoulder in, the rider has to develop a, the so-called bent seat, which means the inside leg is down and a little bit forward near the girth. The outside leg is a little bit farther back. The rider's inside shoulder is a little bit back and the outside shoulder is a little bit forward. Um, this is the same position for canter, travers, half pass, pirouettes, um, all the bending lines and all the canter work. So learning this early will make your journey up the levels much easier and you won't be one of those riders who tries to do shoulder end by bringing their inside leg back, which really pushes the haunches to the outside. It doesn't really do anything to bend the horse. And shoulder in is a function of bend. Um, and when the bend is correct, it puts the inside hind leg into a flexed position, which is the whole point of shoulder in in the first place, which is to supple the inside hind leg. Um, so I just wanted to stress that because it's so important and it relates to so many other movements is the correctness of the shoulder in. And, and again, with, with me, when I see a really nice shoulder in, I go way up in my marks because I see so few of them. You know, they're often with the neck bent in too much or the hind legs are crossing um, or there's a rhythm problem. Or the, so, rails, right, the rails flying around. The what flying around? The rail. The rail <laughs> kicking the rail away, yeah. <laughs> right, losing control of the outside hind leg. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so very important, you know, learn how to ride shoulder in. I mean, there's a whole chapter in uh, Steinbrecht about shoulder in, um, the gymnasium of the horse. So that's, that's really good to read as a little, oh, and speaking of reading, read. There's so many good dressage books and don't just rely on your instructor to teach you. It's important that you have a background of what 
you know, what you're supposed to be doing and, you know, a description of a half pass or a shoulder in, or it, it's just very helpful um, to, to, to study a little bit um, uh, to, to supplement your lessons. And that can lead to a better performance at the show too. So, okay, so I just have a couple of other things. Um, these are pretty obvious, but very important. Know the rules. The rules change all the time. In fact, a lot of us judges, especially me, it, it, we're, it's like, oh my God, now there's another rule. And we're always having to remind ourselves of rule changes because there are a lot of them, right? And it's hard to keep track of them all sometimes. So if you're not sure of something, um, talk to the TD or the steward. They're wonderful. They are happy to help. If you're not sure if your bit is legal or that your whip is, there, is too long or anything, just ask. It's better to ask than to have a problem in your test and, and you know, have this beautiful test only to find out that you're eliminated because you have the wrong bit or, or something like that. So I thought I would throw that in. Um, and then my last suggestion to before, improve your score. Before you go on, before you go yes. on, two participants okay. have asked, what books would you recommend? Oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, the German Federation has some books, um, the, the Arthur Cotas, the Spanish Writing School books, the Charles D. Country has some good books, uh, Gustav Steinbrecht, uh, Gymnasium of the Horse. It's, it's pretty dry and a little technical, um, but that one is good. Um, I'm looking at my Anthony Crossley is good. He has a lot of good ones. Um, I should have, I should give you a list. <laughs> I have hundreds of them. Um, uh, linguist, Ben Lundquist is good. I'm looking at my book, my bookcase right now. Um, that's, that's a start. There's one book that I really enjoy reading and I like even the title and that is by Joe Hinneman and it's called The Simplicity of Dressage. Ah, yes. And I like it because, you know, it focuses on the basics mm -hmm. and makes it simple and makes you realize that it's not... Some people, in my opinion, try to make the whole thing like very complex. You know, mm -hmm. it's like yes. if I ask you, Sandy, how do you walk? How do you stand up and walk around your room? <laughs> how many muscles do you use? Do you start right. with your right, with your leg? What do you do with your sports posture? And I mean, there's so many things. And then sometimes I've seen a lot of instructors that make it as hard as possible. And mm -hmm. you know, Hineman has been, he's one of the best in the world and he makes it simple. That's what I like about that book. And it gives you, you know, the important ideas and from there you can work on it. I, I, I highly recommend that book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I think it's, so you know, to me, you know, learning dressage, it's kind of like going to college. You go to the lectures, but you also have the required reading. You have to have all the textbooks, yeah. you know? And uh, to me, it's the same thing. Otherwise you're putting too much pressure on the instructor to tell you every little thing. Um, and it, it's just a lot easier if you have a, a little bit of background. I, sure. I think position of the rider is so important. And you, had a, wonderful, you had a wonderful lady that wrote, in my opinion, the best books about rider position and that's Sally Sweep centered writing. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's a good one. Those are amazing. Really, yeah. really, really, really good book. Yep, I agree. And, and it's funny. I mean, a lot of problems in training of the horses come back to position. Yes. It really does. I mean, especially if you have more than one horse and they all have the same problem, it's not the horse. You know, if they're all leaning on one rein or if they're all, you know, crooked one direction or whatever, you know, check your position, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of times the rider is one-sided, is more tight on one side of their body or uses one leg stronger than the other or, or has one hand stronger than the other all the time. Um, 
<laughs> I also recommend trying to do things with your non-dominant hand. Like once in a while, try brushing your teeth with your non-dominant hand or, you know, combing your hair with your other hand just to, you know, just to or do yoga and just get more awareness of both sides of your body because your horse is, is already um, not equal on both sides. Most quadrupeds are that way, but humans are that way too. We favor one side and we're trying to make the horse symmetrical. It's very, very difficult. So um, I'm digressing a little bit, but you can tell I'm really in the seat position yeah, <laughs> and, and it's effect on the horse. Very important. Yeah, very important. So, okay, so last point, um, again, pretty obvious, but it's important. And that is read your test sheet when you get it back. Learn from the comments that the judges are making. Um, dressage is super fun, but it's hard. It's hard to make it look easy. And that's the challenge. So it's, I find it really helpful to look at those, at those comments and learn from them and try to improve a little bit with each test. And um, yeah, and pet your horse. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, so. Andy, thank you very much. I, I don't know if you all have questions. You can do it through the chat or if you want me to give you the the audio so that you can ask questions. Super. So I'm gonna try. I'm not that great at this, so bear with me for a second. Okay. So now everybody can talk. <laughs> oh, in the chat now I have. Oops. I hear everybody at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not such a great idea. Well, Sandy, this is Lauren. If you can hear me alone. Yes, I can see you. How are you? All, all I'm going to say is as a writer in the level that I am and all the comments I get as for my, as for my position, Every single day, I work on my position. Every moment of the day. Yay. Again, put your hands down, put your heels down, stretch your legs, because I know when I get in the arena, I'm going to go back to where my... I work all day long, every course, every day on my position so that it is just second nature because I know I'm going to be worse in the arena than I will ever be at home. At home, I win. Great. I think it's very important. And really Lauren, obviously really you have a beautiful position. We all enjoy watching you. Right? But you work hard on it. It's six minutes and you think you're going to do everything right and you're going to go back to those old habits. And when you try to just get muscle memory to remember, put your hands down, put your hands down. It's never going to go as well in, in the arena as it does at home. So it's, it's so valuable to just drill it all the time. Sandy, wait. Un, un, unmute Sandy. Hold on a sec, can I give you the microphone again, Sandy? Oh, there we go. There you go. Now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah no, that, that is so, so, so important. And even an experienced rider like you, we, we, we have to keep working on our position all the time. Muscle memory. Yes, and because the moment we stop, one little, especially trainers, Students are lucky because they have us watching them all the time, but trainers, you know, you'll start doing one little funky thing and then the next day you'll do it again and you'll do it again and then it just gets worse. So you have to constantly check. 100%. I so enjoyed your talk. Thank you for including me and Cesar. It's such a great forum. I really appreciate you doing this. Lauren, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for being here. I'm ready for the next one. <laughs>
down the Yay. side. Let's go. <laughs> okay. We're going to have, for your information, we're going to have my next uh, hosts are going to be Sarah Geike. Then we will have Laura Graves in a week. We're going to have Charles De Canfi. And we're going to have Diogo Lima from Portugal. He's the owner of Ecuador, the famous Lusitano that is doing great points. So we have a lot of good ones coming on. But Sandy, really, this was wonderful. We enjoyed it a lot. I can let so you much. go because I have a last question. How okay. do you handle anxiety before a show? How do you handle what? Anxiety. Anxiety. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's also good for judges. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. That's a loaded question. Um, some people make use of a sports psychologist. Um, some people have luck with meditation. Um, some of it just goes away over years of showing and showing multiple horses per day. Um, maybe the sheer exhaustion of doing that <laughs> helps with the anxiety. Yeah, that's tricky. I mean, some writers have it, have it and have, I, I've had it for years. Mine just slowly went away as I started, you know, doing it more and more. Um, but sometimes it never goes away and you just have to learn how to control it and to not let your horse feel it. You know, that, that's challenging for sure. You know what? Once I found a, a, a DVD that I bought in Wellington, it was mm -hmm. from a sports psychologist mm -hmm. and it had like kind of a program to do um, before you sat on the horse for your warm up. It was like a 30 minute concentration and visualization mm -hmm. video. And I remember I gave that to my nephew mm -hmm. and it did wonders for him. So there, there, there are good things out in the market for that. Yes, the absolutely. Psychology is good, but there are also these things that you can buy online and mm -hmm. they work. Yeah. That many times it's difficult for many writers. So yes. like I have, I can see two girls here from my country here, Fabricia and Brunella, they get no anxiety whatsoever. They're really good at showing, but there are some other ones uh, mm -hmm. they, they get really tense. So yes, yeah, so it's very, if you, don't get, it if you don't get tense, it doesn't matter to you. Sorry? If you, if you don't get tense and you don't have anxiety, it doesn't matter to you. Anxiety shows that you have something invested in it. It's just how you focus your anxiety. If yes. you have no anxiety, then you have nothing on the line. Yes. Anxiety is your body saying we're ready for something. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a good reaction. It's just yeah. learning how to make it slow. Yes, I agree. Yeah. But some people par get paralyzed. Paralyzed. Yeah. That yeah. doesn't work. Some people either, some people either override or some people underride when they're really nervous. Yeah. You know, so it's hard, you know. Meditation is, is can be quite effective with that too. Yes. Yeah. So. Well, Sandy, thank you very much. Well, we thank enjoyed you so it much a for lot. Me. I personally enjoyed it a lot. Okay. Me Anita. too, and I miss you. I miss seeing all of my judging buddies around the world. And I miss you too, that. honestly. At least you've been judging something in the U.S., but I haven't. I cannot even go out of my country. Oh, There's no international yeah. flight, so I'm yeah. stuck here. But I'm enjoying these conversations with you all. Karen, Me too, to very you. much. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And thank you so much, Cesar. Thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thanks a lot, Sandy. This was a wonderful uh, dressage talk. We enjoyed it a lot, and you gave a, really, a lot of really good tips. Super. Happy to help. Miss you. Bye Take bye. care. <laughs> bye bye. Now, everybody has the microphone. Gracias, Cesar. It was very good. I really enjoyed it. 
Thank you, Karen, for joining us. Buenísimo. Gracias. Chao, no, Fabricia y Brunilla. Gracias por entrar. Juana Rosa, ¿sí you want to talk? No, solamente decirte gracias a ti y a, y a Sandy. Muy agradecida. Thanks a lot. Muchas I'm gracias por estar con nosotros. Yes. Para mí también, gracias. María Jimena, tú puedes hablar si quieres. Gracias a todos. Chao. Gracias, chao. Los tengo a, a mute a todos. Activar a todos. Ok, alguien que sigue hablando. Chao, gracias. Bye. Chao, chao, César. Bye. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. 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 bye.